Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Tom Smith. I'm the proud Pensbury Superintendent of Schools. I'd like to welcome you tonight to uh, one of our parent presentations. Um, we've started this year a, a parent and family academy, so each month we'll be doing presentations really to make firm the connection between home and school. Um, I think coming back from COVID and a number of other, th other things that we've seen um, over the past couple of years is it's vitally important that we work together to support our students. Pensbury has a little over 10,000 students um, from all walks of life, and we've made a commitment as a school district and by our board of directors really to focus on supporting the whole child. That includes their mental health and wellness um, in addition to their academics. Um, so I'm going to start with our first presentation of the school year is Mr. George Scott. He's been with us before. Uh, Mr. Scott is also presenting to, he's worked with our administrative team about how we can best support, support students and staff members, but also he'll be working with each faculty, um, going to faculty meetings over the course of this school year, again, talking about trauma-informed care and how to support our students and how to ensure that our staff are taken care of uh, through all this. Before we get started, I would just like to acknowledge and thank um, our board of directors. We have two board of directors here, um, Dr. Joanna Steer and Ms. Linda Palski. Um, as a board, we made a commitment uh, when I first arrived here really to focus on um, the mental health and wellness of our students, so we've done a great job here. Um, also, I want to give a shout out to our counseling department, uh, Justine McGeckern is here. Um, you can call her at any time and she will um, do her best to, to support your students and make sure that we're in a good place. And Dr. Terry Ritchie, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction, uh, is here also. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. George Scott, who's going to take us in for the evening. Um, so just kind of logistics, we're also being live streamed. So we'll, he will do a, a presentation. At the end, there'll be a time for some questions or clarification on anything. Um, this will also be recorded so folks can return back to it for uh, reference. Great. All right, so without that, there you go. Thank you, sir. You know, Tom mentioned the word trauma. That's a scary word. But I want to kind of give you an origin of that word because it's really fascinating and we're going to talk about that tonight. Back in the original Greek, the word trauma meant wound. And if you talk with me, if you listen to me, I have this constant theme that runs through all of my work that's called emotional hurt, emotional wounds. And I have this other phrase too, it's called only clean wounds heal. Just like if you cut yourself and you don't pay attention to it and it's dirty, it'll fester. And if you leave it alone, it'll get worse. And if you leave it alone, you may need to go to the doctor because you need to clean it out. Well, deep emotional wounds respond the same way from our inside world. When we are hurt, we used to believe that time heals all wounds. The reality is that's not what the science says. The research says that time actually conceals, pushes it away, and at some other point in your life, it'll come back and it'll kind of influence your life in ways that maybe you don't want to be influenced. All around the word trauma. So, we've been here before. That's a good thing for me. I love it when I have an opportunity to layer up some thinking differently about what our kids are exposed to, what moms and dads and the other adults in the room, whether you're a mom or a dad or perhaps a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or a godparent or, or, or you can see all the roles you play, and how your own wounds also influence the environment that influences the kids. And when we do our work with teachers, we talk about that all the time. Can we create a sanctuary in the classroom where when kids feel really safe and connected, oh my God, the academics just begin to sizzle because kids then can relax and they can open up this wonderful brain that they have and do some learning. So we're gonna address some of that tonight. So I don't know, I mean, I don't know whether you remember, we were here at the beginning of the year in the midst of COVID with masks on in January of 2022, kind of as an introduction for me getting acquainted with Pensbury and Pensbury getting acquainted with me. Let's march through some things here. That's what we did in January. 
tired of talking about COVID? Well, then let's talk about healing. And there comes that wound issue again, right? The wounds need to be healed. But tonight is different. Tonight is called an inconvenient truth. Now, I know some of you remember Al Gore used that when he did his introduction, his documentary on climate change, right? He called it that, and I thought, I, you know, I, I guess I need to give Al Gore some credit. He didn't, he's not the one that originated the phrase. Actually, the phrase was initiated by that guy. Mark Twain first used it, and he defined it as, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure, but treat it as if it ain't so. We kind of turn our head a little bit because it's uncomfortable. We don't want to look at it. We don't want to invest time and energy in it. It's just darn inconvenient. And we're going to see how that plays into some of the kind of the barriers that get in the way of us engaging both our own children, kids in the classroom, other adults, people within our own family. What are those barriers? So it's not surprising about COVID, right? If you look at the data that's coming out, folks who emotionally were pretty darn healthy before COVID, they're still pretty darn healthy after COVID emotionally. Even if they contracted the illness, they seem to have a way of keeping that spirit, keeping that attitude up. But the opposite is also true. For folks who were not as healthy emotionally before COVID, their suffering is even greater. I think there's some teaching in that. I think that's a, that's a learning, teaching, teaching, learning moment about what happens post-COVID. The, the inconvenient truth is, is that we actually know what interferes with wellness. We don't have to guess. We don't have to explore. We know the science is there to say this is how it all works inside of us as human beings. We know how to support recovery. When emotional recovery is needed, when we need to get to a better place, a more well place, we know how to do that. We also, we know what healthy adults look like. We know what healthy kids look like. We even know what healthy adolescents look like. None of it's a surprise. None of it's a secret. We have an understanding. And we also know what safe environments look like, and those environments promote healing. The opposite is true as well. Unhealthy environments get in the way of. Unhealthy environments sabotage. So we have to be really sensitive to that. I have been known to make people uncomfortable, whether in the room or live stream. I've been known to say things that make people kind of break eye contact or get a little anxious. They seldom have ever get up and leave, which is a good thing, but they do get a little uncomfortable. But I'm okay with that because that's exactly what we want for us in terms of growth and change, but that's also what we expect for our own kids. We know that they grow during uncomfortable moments if they're supported. We know that when they're challenged in the classroom and they achieve, we know that that makes them feel a whole lot better. So the challenging information, from my perspective, is not a problem. We know how it all works, however. It only works if there's a will and an urgency. So what I know is, is that after you folks leave here this evening or you folks at home that kind of click off of your TV or off of the streaming of this, of this uh, conversation, nothing may change. And if nothing changes, nothing changes. But what I'm hoping is, is that there's a little nugget of something that makes you feel uncomfortable enough, particularly for yourself, for your family, for your own children, for your kids in the classroom, the kids in your school, whatever your role is, so that there's an, a movement forward, an urgency to make it a priority. I can tell you this about, about Pensbury, and this goes back a year now. When I first got uh, a call or email from, from uh, your superintendent to say, hey, listen, you know, I, I know what you do and I know what you say and I know what you stand for. Are you willing to come and begin a conversation here in our school district? And he made that commitment for the district, and I think that's terrific. There was a sense of urgency that said great districts have both high academic achievement and wellness in balance. 
So for those of you that are community members, have your kids in this school district, good for you, because they're on the right track from my perspective in terms of healing and being well and, and being able to take the wounds of life or the stressors of life and make it better for themselves. So this is where we left off. We talked about penguins. So I'm going to kind of tap back onto them, but I want to reintroduce you to the rats. These are rat pups. These are little rats, and we're going to tell you what both the penguins and the pups have to do with you and your children and what we know because of their behavior. Perhaps you remember this, right? These are these little king penguin chicks born into a very hostile environment. Now, I always have to make this caveat. That hostile environment existed long before the lawyers committed the term, uh, created the term working in a hostile environment. That's truly a hostile environment. But they're built, they're, they're built to be born into it. You know, they're, they're kind of tiny, and they've got these layers of fat and these little fur coats, and it looks like it works out really well for them, but not always. Because sometimes the environment gets even more hostile. And when it gets more hostile in order to survive, there's a parallel here be about our, us as people, they, incur, they seek shelter when it gets overwhelming. That's why when we're creating sanctuary classrooms, that becomes a shelter. A trusted adult, the counselor, the nurse, a teacher becomes trusted adult. Kids who know who to go to when they just need to be in the presence of somebody that they can trust who will protect them. However, some of our children don't have a trusted adult. So what about those kids? If a trusted adult is really important for survival, what about those kids? Whether they're little ones in preschool or they're are, are big kids at the high school or even children that are off to college, what about them if in this life they don't have a trusted adult? Hostile environment. Sometimes they seek shelter of each other. And I got a little byline there that says, which is not the best for younger kids. Let me explain that. There was some research done that says, has the culture shifted in a way that it's toxic for our kids? And what's the family's role in that? And here's what we found. When kids are like 14, 15, and 16, we call it differentiating. They begin to get an identity apart from their family. They go and hang out with kids, and then they come home. They spend more and more time away from mom and dad, then they come home. That's normal differentiation, and it should happen early teen years into upper teen years. That's healthy. But our younger children should not be differentiating. They need the protection of the older people in their lives if the older people, in fact, are trusted and healthy. But here's what happens. When parents are distracted, either because of work, illness, other responsibilities, their own burdens, when parents turn away from their kids, both figuratively and emotionally, those younger kids need somebody, and they seek out other kids. That's where it's not healthy, because kids can't give kids good advice. Kids can't give kids a way to solve a problem or, or good information that will help keep them safe. Little kids require us to do that. So we want the shelter of each other for our older kids, but we do not want it for our younger kids yet. Here's where it gets a little dicey. It gets a little dicey at the point where you're doing Xbox or PlayStation, for instance. When you have relationships on the internet through gaming, for instance, with other people, and we've normalized that a bit. I don't have a problem with that in general. But what we know is that sometimes our younger children get exposed to things that we can't protect them from. We're going to talk about buffering. It's a term that means a role that adults have of standing in front of kids to protect them from dangers. That's called buffering. When kids differentiate too young, when they wander away from the adults too soon, then what that does is creates situations in which our kids are at jeopardy 
of being harmed, being hurt, inheriting some wounds that are emotional. So we're going to keep an eye on that. Hostile environment. And then when the environment becomes more and more and more hostile, something in nature happens that's wonderful, the adults show up. There's a great book out. Dan Siegel is the author. It, it's a parenting book. It's a book written for parents that talks about the best thing healthy parents can do for their children is show up, be present, to be able to be in their world, buffer them, support them, and that's the kind of model that we want. That's exactly how we'd like to see it play out. So it's about survival because if the adults don't show up, the chicks die. And emotionally, that happens to us as human beings. If we're not protected from the toxic things that go on, the stressors, emotionally we can shrink, be wounded, and literally die. We certainly don't want that. That makes us uncomfortable, as it should. So what happens here? The storm brews, gets colder, snows more, they begin to huddle in the shelter of each other, and then the adults create sanctuary. They create this huge group where everybody in the community huddles together. On the inside, you'll see the chicks, you'll see the older penguins, you'll see the infirmed penguins, and the healthy penguins are out these outer rings because what they're doing is they're buffering them from the storm, and you can see that they even have their backs to the storm. I think that is just so cool in nature, how the adults show up in a healthy way. There's another cool thing that's in this picture. There are going to be times in which these guys here get pretty darn cold. You can imagine as they're turned in and the winds are howling, they get cold. So what happens is, is that the warm penguins in the middle shuffle out and the cold penguins shuffle in and they learn to protect each other from the hostile environment. And nobody taught them to do that. It's natural. And the reality is, among healthy adults, it's natural too. Naturally protective of our babies, regardless of whether they're just born or whether they're older. Hmm. So showing up, buffering the young, creating sanctuary. That's the solution. Call it a truth. As adults, the, the well-being of all of our kids in our homes, our schools, our community is our responsibility. They can't be self-directed when they're young, and we allow them to practice that as they get older. But the real responsibility is the healthy adults who pay attention in a healthy way. Or at very least, we're responsible for creating environments and designing practices that nurture that recovery and that wellness. And that is what Pensbury is doing. They're investing in creating environments that help kids heal, that they may bring with them to school some, some wounds, some emotional wounds and experiences from life, from the neighborhood, from the home, things that happen to them. But when they get into the comfort of the school with a healthy teacher, teacher assistant, any adult in the school environment, what happens is they begin to heal and they realize the difference between that danger and this comfort. Pensbury's doing that. Now this next slide or two or three is one of those, nah, are you sure? Because I'm gonna challenge your understanding of the inconvenience of the truth that I'm going to tell you. Because here's what the research says. It's now demonstrating that the impact of lived experiences, things that go on in your life, is more profound than the impact of genetics. There's finally research that teases that out. Home environments, school environments, community environments, lived experiences have more of a profound impact on shaping the child than does the genetic strain that comes down through the generations. That's inconvenient because that is not what we 
learned when we were growing up. Remember this, I mean, it's, when we were growing up thinking, it was always nature, nurture, and DNA kind of one out. It's kind of like, well, what do you expect? Have you seen his father? It's DNA. Because we believed that DNA really was the predominant shaping of what we know now is it is not. In fact, there's a new science, it's probably not new, new, it's new to me, called epigenetics. And epigenetics is about how you read the genes. It's about how the environment actually flips on these little switches that makes people more vulnerable to things like asthma and cancer, some pulmonary, other pulmonary cardiac issues. It's pretty amazing science. It's, and it's, it's showing that the environment in which we live is the profound effect. Did you know that young kids' stress hormone levels are heavily influenced by the emotional atmosphere in the homes? Whether it is outright conflict or this underlying tension, which is why in conversations with moms and dads, we want to be able to share that with them. Because here's one of my premises. I think moms and dads set out to do absolutely the best they can do. I just can't imagine. In the birthing room, this mom and this dad with this little baby, and they gaze at this baby and they look at each other, and the first thing the parents say is, gee, I wonder how we can screw this kid up. That doesn't ever happen. That's just not a thing. The thing is a hopefulness that we have as moms and dads around the babies that we create. But what we now know is that when kids are in high-stress situations, their bodies react by pumping cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And if it doesn't fluctuate because the, 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 the tension doesn't go away, it stays within the body. It has a profound effect on kids both emotionally, physically, and academically. And sometimes we're just not even aware of that. There's another piece here that says the inflammation of a child's lungs, for example, like with asthma, is directly affected by mom and dad's emotions. That the atmosphere that gets created, the weather that gets created in the homes, if it's filled with tension or chaos or argument, one of the outcomes can, in fact, be that kids develop asthma. That was not a thing when I was growing up. And I'm going to show you a really interesting clipping from a paper from one week ago today on the same topic. It has been consistently shown that parents who are struggling with their own well-being, whether you call it depression or anxiety or stress or chronic irritation, it predicts a poor outcome for the child's asthma because of the stressor, because of the cortisol stressor. And what we know about cortisol is, is that it will have influence on your gut. It will have influence pulmonary and cardiologically. I don't even know that that's a word, but they kind of knew what I was talking about. And about our headaches, the stressors coming from the atmosphere and the stress in, in the home or in the school. I love this new book. I, I love Gabor Mate. If you have never read him or seen him, he's got a couple of really good videos out. And the book's called The Myth of Normal, that sometimes we have gotten to the point where we're so used to a crazy behavior that we normalize it as being normal, and it ain't. That the behavior actually is unhealthy. And how do we recalibrate that? So, so what? Like, what's, what's, what's the point? This was the headline from NewJersey.com last week. Kids are pouring into New Jersey hospitals. A spate of respiratory illnesses filling pediatric beds. New Jersey hospitals are filling up with kids coughing and struggling to breathe, and it's not influenza, and it's not COVID. Got my interest. But I immediately began to think and wonder whether it was a post-COVID stress reaction. Did our babies, depending upon the community and the family, your means and whether people got sick or didn't, 
how you managed it, how frustrating it was to, to have to be online or to work from home, all of that stuff, right? All of that. Now I'm beginning to wonder whether or not what kids were exposed to, in fact, lingers and is now having this pulmonary effect. Now, I'm probably not going to get a lot of MDs who agree with me on that, but I'm okay with that because it fits with the science of how toxic stress affects the body, both adults and kids. Might this be the result of stresses and disruptions in the lives of kids prior to and during COVID? Check this out in terms of your own family. Certainly this is true in the, in the, the people that I have checked, checked with on this. One of the things that we can point to during COVID is a disruption of, of routines in the family. Routines that had existed before, when the family ate, when kids went to bed, when you brushed your teeth, when you got up, where you had to be, those routines frizzled away for most of us. And when kids are without routines, inside they feel chaotic. They need these guardrails just like we all do. You know, I always say one of the reasons why schools are so wonderful is because they're scheduled and structured. And kids need to know that. They need to know what's coming next. They need to know what's happening Wednesday. They need to know when they're going to eat, when they should be in, and when they're leaving. That makes them feel more safe and more comfortable. In our homes, the same thing. Families that are running between sports fields or working part-time or kids are in this room on this device and kids are on this room on the device and there's no, not this orderliness about it, actually the kids don't do as well. It becomes disruptive. That's what we're talking about here. At least from my point of view, that's the truth. Even if we don't want to believe that because it's inconvenient. It doesn't feel good for us. We can't see our way towards solution, so therefore we don't give it attention. What do we do with the truth that's inconvenient? How, how do we protect our kids? How do we do that? How do we set up our homes, our schools, our classrooms, our relationships, the sports team that you coach, the, the church group that you're a leader of, the, 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 the Boy Scout troop, the Girl Scout troop? Oh, you know you have lots of involvement with kids all the time. Is there a way to protect the kids from the effects of the threat? Let's talk about rats. Well, nobody left. That's a good sign. What can we learn here? And is this related in some way to our own children? For years now, probably 10, maybe 15, I would come across articles about McGill University in Canada and Dr. Michael Meany and his work, because he was working on this issue of the relationship between stress and mood. How does stress change mood, and what do you do about it? There he is, Dr. Meany at McGill. They wanted to work with these rat pups, these babies. And here's the first thing that they found. They observed that when they removed the rat pup from the cage where the mom and the sibs were and put them in a small plastic box, the animals got anxious. Well, I can tell you, I'd get anxious too if you took me out of my home and stuck me in a small plastic box. But they got jittery. They got really anxious. And when they tested the blood, the blood had high levels of cortisol, stress hormone. Just the idea of isolating them and putting them in a smaller container. Some, some rats reacted more strongly than others, like these guys. These guys really reacted to the stressors. But that wasn't the core of the research. The core of the research is what happened next. The researchers found that when they returned the, the, the pups to the family cage, <clears throat> pups who received a healthy dose of maternal licking and grooming developed into much calmer adults. When the mom got to them and settled them down, 
and groom them and lick them, those rats calmed. Now, there's a beginning of a lesson here in terms of the power of calming, of soothing, of nurturing. The pup who received more attention was, less, was not so easily startled, no startle response, more curious, and did not suffer surges of stress hormone. Now, we want calm and curious to be in the classroom. When learners are calm and curious, they engage the learning, they engage each other, they pay attention to the teacher and learning happens. When they are not calm, the opposite happens. And when we were in, here in January, I remember us talking about the fact that as the stress hormones build or as kids become more anxious or they're more afraid, what happens actually is the thinking brain here goes offline. It doesn't work as well. Let me give you an example in your own life. Some of you might raise your hand if I were to say, how many of you love taking tests? Say, like, oof, tests really upset me. They upset a lot of kids as well. And we've got a picture of a little kid earlier who studied, studied, studied the night before for this quiz. He knew it cold. He got to the quiz, and he couldn't recall a thing because his angst was up. This part of the brain shut down. He couldn't access the memory of what we know he knew. More curious, did not suffer surges of stress. And these little guys who were neglected by the mother, they startled very easily. They were reluctant to explore, and they were always pumping stress hormone. What calmed it down was the relationship between that caring adult, that mom, the licking and grooming, and the pup. The most intriguing part was that the, whoops, sorry about that, when the pups of minimal licking moms, moms that didn't give a lot of attention to the pups, when those pups were then moved to over here to a, another female rat, a mom who was a high licker, the kids adopted to the foster mom. It wasn't just the fact of the mom. What it was is the attention given, which is behind the whole premise of adoption and fostering, right? The whole premise of that whole system is that there are circumstances in which the birth parents are unable or unwilling to nurture, and the hope of the system is fine nurturing rat moms and dads, and the more licking and grooming, the kids will be okay. They will be okay because their system will be calmed. That's pretty fascinating. Good for those new foster moms. And I think this is where we come in as healthy and trusted adults. This is where we make a difference. I have teachers say to me all the time, rightly so. George, I can't be responsible for what goes on at home. No, you can't, nor should you. Even those parents that give it their best, sometimes the best isn't good enough to really keep the kids healthy. However, if you become a licking, grooming mom, you can calm that body in the classroom and the academics go up because the system changes. You don't have to change mom and dad. Nobody's asking you to do that. We're asking you to create sanctuary environments in which kids feel safe and comfortable and relaxed, that somebody has their back, that they're welcomed and connected. And when that happens, when they begin to trust it, this part of the brain does light up and learning does happen and interpersonal communication and relationships do happen when there's consistency on that. They also found that those traits tended to carry on to the next generation. In other words, a high-licking mom had daughters that went on to lick and groom their own kids. It was intergenerational. I'll tell you why that fascinates me. Because what we know is a lot of the trauma, a lot of the wounding is also intergenerational. What we know is, if you can trace this back to grandparents and great-grandparents, there were issues sometimes that created uncomfortable or 
unhealthy environments to those pups. They came down and created families, but they only knew that model, so they did that, and that passed that on, and we used to think it was genetics. We used to think, for instance, there was a predisposition for alcoholism. That's being called into question. Now what we're looking at is alcoholism as a symptom, not as a disease, more of a dis-ease. And the fact that we see it inherent in some families because of environment, not because of genetic strains. Lived experiences have a more profound effect on the human being than the genes and the epigenetics. When they took the offspring of a low licking mom and raised it with a high licking mom, the rat adopts the high licking behavior. Change the environment, the rat changes his or her behavior. The argument here is that this rat experiment, what's being transmitted is not love. Now, I had to stop right there. Apparently, the mother loved the, the pups. But the researchers said that didn't make the difference. It wasn't the love. What it was was the calm, the safetyness, and the peace. Let me allow you to have that then when we create sacred space around our babies, and it can be calm, and it can be peaceful, and it's safe for them, that makes the difference. And here's the inconvenient truth. Kids can't create that space for themselves because they're kids. The reason it's an inconvenient truth is because we begin to think about all of the times perhaps that we didn't offer ourselves in the best way that we could, either in a classroom or the kid next door who, who's thrown acorns at your windows or whatever might be going on in the neighborhood. Because what we also know is if you've got those long-standing wounds, you're probably pretty reactive. And, and I don't want to make the mistake of saying that there's anybody either at home or, or here in the audience that gets cranky, but my guess is some of you get cranky sometimes irritable. That's hard for kids. It was hard for you to have somebody be irritable with you, and it sets off this cortisol spin in you. What did I do wrong? It's as if the mother is saying to her pups that licking and grooming, now this is George's interpretation. I don't know. If I checked it out with some rats, they probably would tell me I'm onto something. Because it's like, it's okay. You're safe now. No, no one's going to hurt you. Lick, lick, lick. I, I'm here with you. Lick, lick, lick. I'll pay attention. I'll calm you guys. Everything is going to be okay. That's what the licking and grooming says. Who wouldn't want that mom? Now, let me make something just very clear here. You cannot go home and lick your kids. Teachers cannot lick kids in the classroom. It's just not a thing. <laughs> the rat pup could do that and get away with it. But what the, how does that interpret for us? Research suggests that the most critical thing that we can transmit to our kids is not our undying love. Now, this is going to be right in the face of some people, and I'm not apologizing. Because there are some times that moms and dads have to allow space for kids to explore and get it wrong and bump their heads and fall off their bikes. They've got to be able to do that. It's not about undying love. It's actually being able to provide with a sense of calm and the absence of stress. How can we protect our children? We know we can't protect them from life's stressors because life has stress all the time. Let me check that out. And I can't see you folks at home, but I can just imagine you sitting there waiting for, with bated breath at my next question. How many of you don't have stress in your life? Never had a hand raised. Life is inherent with it. 
Some stress is good stress that motivates us. Some stress builds up, but we can get rid of it pretty easily. Go for a walk, ride our bikes, go for a massage, go have yoga. Right? We can get rid of it. And there's some of that stress, however, that turns dark and toxic, and it gets held in the body. The book is called The Body Keeps the Score. Think about the asthmatic kids. Think about those kids that suffer other kinds of physical illnesses or emotional illnesses. I always ask myself, is it an accumulation of toxic stressors in that environment? What are some ways that human moms lick and groom their kids? How do you do that? Now, this is, the, I'm, I'm duplicating what the kids in the classroom are doing. Like, this is a trick question. Well, I'm not raising my hand. What if I get it wrong? Everybody's going to laugh at me. Kids do that all the time. How do you, how do you groom and lick your children? You read to them, right? You cuddle up in bed. You get a favorite book that you've read a hundred times, and you read it a hundred and one. That's licking and grooming. How else do you do that with your babies? Just cuddling, period, even without a book, right? In a safe way that they just kind of nuzzle into you. And isn't it a wonderful time? And you can feel their bodies melt because they're relaxing. They feel safe in the shelter of you. That's another way. How else do you lick your kids? Have fun with them. Go for a walk. Ooh and ah about things that they discover. Laugh together. Fix a favorite meal. There are lots of ways that we can surround our kids, not just with tchotchke things, but good stuff that helps to soothe them and calm them so that their minds work the way we want and hope that their minds will work. The inconvenient truth is, friends, it's up to us to do that. They can't do that for themselves. So, drugs or hugs? Meany asked this question, and I have a political comment to make about it. He said, of course we can think in terms of developing drugs to produce the same effect. However, if the initial effect was laid down in response to social stimulus, is there then the possibility that some sort of social experience might be able to reverse the process the answer is yes, but it's inconvenient because it's not fast enough. We want it fast. There are only two countries in the whole world that are allowed to publicly advertise medications. Finland and us. And what we know is that most of the commercials that we see, whether we're streaming or whether we're watching network TV or, or cable TV, are pharmaceutical medications. I have a point to prove. I said earlier that an accumulation of stressors in our body could be held either here with headaches, could be held here with pulmonary, shortness of breath, could be heart disease as we get older, or it could be in your gut. It could be belly aches. It could be, yeah, we have to talk about this, diarrhea and constipation. Think about commercials on TV. Do you think that's a target audience? Irritable bowel syndrome, peptobismo, lizesse, you can go on and on and on and on. Why is that? Because the society in which we live, unless we carve out sacred space, produces stressors that are inherent in the body, and many, many times they're in us and in our children. When I was back in my last district, um, up in South Brunswick, Middlesex County in New Jersey, <clears throat> Part of my responsibility were my nurses, right? And they scared me, because they know a lot. And they have very high standards. And they taught me a lot. And I would go and do visits to do nothing other than get a sense of how the nurse's office was and who the, quote, frequent flyers are to the nurse's office. Two things are coming out of this story. Two reasons why kids ask to go to the nurse. Headaches and belly aches. It's not a coincidence. It's an inconvenient truth that high stress in a classroom, 
Even if you walked in, you wouldn't see it. But for this little guy, for Georgie, it's really high stress. Maybe because there's other stuff going on at home. Maybe somebody insulted him on the bus. Maybe somebody took his lunch. He doesn't know what to do with it. He's really anxious. He's either got a headache or a bellyache and wants to go see the nurse. That's story number one. Story number two is frequently I would walk in unannounced and the nurse would be on the phone with the mom, usually, sometimes the dad. And I would overhear the conversation and the nurse would say, you know, the mom was concerned what she was calling was to say that Georgie wouldn't be in school today because he was having belly problems. And he was really embarrassed because of the diarrhea and he'd have to go to the bathroom. He didn't want to have an accident. She said, but you know what's really interesting is the mom also said to me, we've taken him to the pediatrician. We've had all of the tests that can be done. Nobody can find anything wrong in my kid's belly. I think they were looking in the wrong place. Lived experience has more of a profound effect effect than anything organic inside, which is why we have to be, should be so sensitive to environment. So what to do? Routines, right? Routines in your, in, in your family. There are five things that are really good for your well-being, sleep, nutrition, exercise, some type of physical movement, whether it be a walk or a run, whether it be Tai Chi, whether it be yoga, whether it be whatever it is, dance. And the last thing is healthy relationships. Those five things are prerequisites for all of us. And in the absence of that, we begin to feel it physically and emotionally. During COVID, things were disrupted terribly. How do I know that? Last spring, when kids first started coming back to schools, now I'm in about 13 different districts in New Jersey. I'm over here in Pennsylvania. I would sit and I would listen to the stories from teachers and administrators. And kids that surprised them would come back with behavior that was like, who are you? Disrespectful. I don't have to listen making fun of other kids, all of the social stuff that had been groomed a year to two years be before was now gone, not because parents didn't care about it. That wasn't a priority when we were in this annihilation event trying to survive. And I don't want you to forget that event. We didn't know what was happening. Then we were told what was happening. Then we were told that wasn't happening. Then we were told there is medication, there isn't medication, and then there's this other medication. That's not how we live. We rely on information or we rely on past experience to get us through new experiences. There was nothing like it, incredibly disruptive. And if it was disruptive to you with more lived experience, then it may certainly have been disruptive for your kids. What do storm clouds look like in the home or in the school? I don't need to read them. You can see them at home. You can read them from here in the room. They are all about adult attitude that doesn't promote well-being in children. And they're not bad adults. They may be wounded adults. They may be highly stressed adults. They're not bad people. But it doesn't matter because it transmits to the kids. Up here is this phrase, it comes from Sandra Bloom, hurt people, hurt people. And I keep that as a takeaway. When I see behavior that's aggressive toward other kids, whether it's online or verbal or physical, I'm always wondering what's going on behind that behavior. Because hurt people hurt people. So take this with you. If you don't make time for your wellness, then your body will force you to make time for your illness. It will happen. Some of you have more stamina and more resiliency than others because of lived experiences. But ultimately, if you don't pay attention here and deep inside of here, the body will say, pay attention. Red flags. These are just things, and I'll send this um, PowerPoint to the district tomorrow. These are things to pay attention to, to say, ooh, 
George said, that's a red flag. I have to pay attention to that. These are things that when you see them in your children, be aware and be cautious. Be curious. Ask about them. Don't dismiss them. Don't turn away. That's not an inconvenient truth. This is a red flag of hurt. There's a wound there festering that you can, as a, as a mom or a dad, you can affect healing on that. And the healthier you are, the more you can affect healing on that. Before I end with this story, and then we can take some questions. Um, the question may come up later, but if it doesn't, I just want to raise this now. I was doing a presentation earlier today, and the question came up like, hey, how come you're picking on the mother rats? What about the father rats? That was a great question. I had never thought of it. So there were about 150 people on the call, and one of them said, she sent in a message on the chat that says, can I open my mic? And what she said is, I happen to know the answer to that question. She said, because I work in a lab, and here's the answer. When they put male rats in the cage, the male rats eat the babies. They're that aggressive that they're separated out. It's the females that are the nurturers. Now, fortunately, that has been evolutionized out of the males today, I hope. Although I do know that hurt people hurt people, and there's anger and aggression. But when healthy, when dads are healthy, when grandpas are healthy, aunts and, I mean, the uncles are healthy, yeah, they can be good nurturers too. They can do good licking too. Having a catch, pulling somebody in a wagon, bouncing a ball, that's how you lick the kids. You can do those kinds of things. And I want to end with this. Pretty right? So some of you perhaps invest some of your time as a gardener. You just kind of love to get your hands in the soil. And actually, the science behind that says, good for you. People who do work with their hands, actually, it's a way of getting rid of some of the built-up energies and anxieties. Woodworkers, for instance, gardeners. Here's the story. If you fail to water that flower, and you don't provide enough sunlight, If you give no attention and offer no nurture and the flower dies, don't blame the flower. Let's stop blaming our kids. Let's stop characterizing them and putting labels on them. Let's take a look at us and the environments that we're creating. Let's help kids to work together with us to create environments that are healthier because we know the system it's an inconvenient truth that we know how the human psyche body work interchangeably. That's me. You, that's my cell phone number. If you want to call me or text me, please feel free to do that. If you have a real negative criticism, please don't do that because I'll probably cry when I get it on the other end of the phone. But that's there so you can access me with a question, with a comment. This is my email address here at the bottom at the Counseling Center. This is new. Just started a, a new forum called Minding Our Children. Don't you love that phrase? It means to pay attention. How do we mind our children? It's a forum to give parents an opportunity to say more, to listen more, to learn more, to do more. Yes, it is hard work but it is also heart work that we're expected to do as adults in the lives of kids. So thank you very much, and if there are questions here or up there, I will take them. You got to monitor this, sir? Any questions? Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Have I ever told you a story about the 20 second hug? I love it. I love it. So, so here's the issue. Sometimes we are, I don't know all the dynamics between you and your kids or the dynamics within the family. But even as our kids get older, and even though they want to differentiate and they want to move out there in the world, they really still do love connection. Attachment's still important. Making a favorite meal, it's important. You're out and you see something that you know that they've been talking about that they would like. It's a little kind of dollar, five dollar thing and you get it. The message is, I was thinking of you. So those are the things that moms and dads do with their babies of all ages, just to let them know you still matter to me. If they fuss, it's okay as the mom or dad to say, hey listen, can I get on your schedule so that I can have 15 minutes to have a conversation with you? Very respectful, right? Because normally what you get is I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. So you schedule it. You get their sacred time of 15 minutes. And then you are able to lay out the things that you want them to know without overwhelming them. I know you're getting older. And, and you know, and good for you that you're involved in this, that, and the other thing. But I miss you. Is there a way that we can still get connected, stay connected, do connected things. In the right environment, kids love that because it's an adult conversation and you're not imposing and you're not judging and you're not criticizing. So there are things that we can do which is licking and grooming still. Some of you know that when your adult children leave the home, some of those buggers come back and they come back for a reason because it's a safe place, it's a good place, it's familiar. So then you have to do different things to kind of encourage them to fly, but it's a really good sign of some good stuff that's happening within the family. Stay connected. John Bowlby's work on attachment, 50, 60, 70 years old, that, that research, still powerful in terms of human beings don't survive or thrive without healthy attachments throughout their whole life. And what we do and what we hope happens is that our babies kind of grow and then they partner up with somebody that they love and they, they continue the attachment. That they create their own babies and you can see the attachment. That's the, that's the look of healthiness and healthy being. Don't let them get away. You're still his mom. Other comments or questions? Yes, yes. And the structure is, right, you can anticipate what, what's expected of them. That's absolutely true. And keep this in mind, there's another secret here that I think some parents don't get. And it's worthy of saying to your kids, I can be annoyed with you and love you at the same time. Because what kids believe is when you're angry with them, you've stopped loving them. So no, 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 I still love you. You're still my baby. But right now, I am really annoyed. Yes, you separate out their behavior from the person. And I love the fact when you began this metaphor of, I got this things going in my head. That's not random, folks. Your body will talk to you physically, and your mind will talk to you in thoughts and emotion. Pay attention. Listen to self. It will let you know what's going on in here. So good for you, and thank you for that. Anyone else? We're at the witching hour. I can't use that phrase until October, right? Thank you, George, again. 
I'd like to just thank again our board for their commitment to this. Um, we're going to keep building on it, our uh, Parent and Family Academy. Um, we're going to keep it going. Every month we'll have a presentation. Um, putting a shout out, actually, for next Monday is the first ever Pensbury Social Media Night. Um, so we're going to be doing some work that if you have a teenager um, and struggling with social media uh, with that, that it's a great uh, presentation will be given. But again, thank you very much to George Scott for his presentation this evening. And good night.